Have you ever wondered how music is selected for commercials and advertising? Well, if you have, then you don't want to miss our conversation with veteran music advertising executive, Josh Rabinowitz. We discuss the incredible impact having your music used in commercials can have on your career, as well as the changing attitudes of artists regarding letting their music be used in commercials and much, much more. Coming up. This episode of the Mubu TV Insider Video Series is brought to you by the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label A&R, music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 30 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a r Registry, the Film and Television Music Guide, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com to catch up with Josh Rabinowitz, who's the head of music at Gray Advertising. Josh, thanks so much for joining us. I oh, really appreciate it. Of thanks. course. Now, as head of music at, uh, of Gray Advertising, can you talk to us about exactly what your job entails? Sure. I have a group of six, including myself, and we oversee all the music that's utilized in the advertising. Okay. We're in charge of either procuring uh, original music, commissioning people to do work for hires, or licensing music. Those are the two main things that we do. Um, it's a creative job, but it's also a business job. So there's certainly helping people musically figure out what they want. Uh, we collaborate with a team of creative people and production people at the agency, as well as with our clients. We also deal with the business aspect of it. So we deal, do the deals. We do the negotiations. We do all the music rights agreements. We do um, all the union agreements, the SAG reports, the AF of M reports. And we also police copyright infringement, which is a very important aspect of what we do. Talk about the copyright infringement in terms of what, how does that happen in your world with regards to commercials? It's a very good question. Essentially what happens mainly in an advertisement is someone puts together kind of an edit, a rough cut of an oh. ad, and they cut to a piece of music. What we try to do is get pieces of music in front of them that are available, but oftentimes people will find a piece of music that they really want to cut to, something that's been moving them. You know, it's a creative process, the editorial process. So some of the editors are really particular about the pieces of music they use or the types of music choices that they make. They want to make those choices themselves. So they'll take a piece of music, they cut to it. People are sitting in the editorial suite and they're falling in love with this piece of music. Uh, so it's demo love. And yes. uh, that's, that's kind of a, a tough thing for us. So they fall in love with something that they can't necessarily have. So what happens oftentimes are people... Um, people do ask us to copy that piece of music within kind of um, the restrictions of the law or, you know, within the limits of the law. And we hate doing it, but it does happen and it's happened throughout history. Um, so you hear a lot of sound alike things. If, you, if you've been watching TV commercials for the last 15, 20 years, you can, if you're someone who's fairly expert in it to semi expert in it, you can generally tell what the track was. That was the reference track that people cut to. And we police that. We try not to let people do things that are like other things that sound like other things. However, not every, every, excuse me, not every advertising agency has that capability. They don't have in-house music people, and they don't have even uh, producers or editors or creative people that understand that aspect of it, and that can be a problem. So when you give a client uh, a piece of or the ad with the music that they have fallen in love with that was not cleared... Hmm. Is this something that you have found has ended up being a problem? Like there, it's gotten out somehow or there's a copyright issue because of that? Well, we try not to play things for the client that they can't have. Right. And if they find something that they like and they really want it, they'll push us and push us to try to get it. And it's, it's a difficult scenario um, and it's problematic. So what we try to do is preclude it. We try to prevent it. It's preventative medicine. It's uh, something that we, we take very seriously. Now, when you talk about a piece of music that a client can't get. Is it economically that they can't afford that piece of music or is it creatively like a Neil Young situation where the artist simply won't have their music in commercials or is it both? It's both for okay. sure. Um, we've had several scenarios where people have actually even agreed to licensing us a piece of music and then they 
saw the creative or they saw a version of the spot and they're like, well, we've changed our mind. We don't want to do it. And it's, it's a really interesting phenomenon. It, it happens all the time. I've worked with artists. I work with uh, the Black Eyed Peas in their early phase before Fergie out here in, in Los Feliz. And I remember sitting with uh, Will Adams, Will I Am, and he's like, you know, this is going to ruin our credibility in the community. I don't know if I really want to do this. You know, he was actually creating an original piece of music for the advertising, kind of a jingle, if you will. And I was like, well, I don't necessarily feel like it's going to ruin your credibility, but it, maybe personally you might have a problem with it. You know, you're selling out. I call it selling in. If you don't sell in, you're left behind. Um, so to me, I said to him, it's a way of reaching people and it's a way of music discovery and people are going to see you and it's, it's going to be a really excellent way to get your music out there. The only reason I knew about them is because they had worked with Macy Gray on something at that point. So I have worked with other artists where like they're in the middle of a process and they kind of change their mind. They're wishy-washy, but that was like 10 or 15 years ago. Right. Yeah. Josh, over the last 15, 20 years, let's say, has the attitude among artists, uh, especially in the licensing of pre-recorded material, has that shifted in relation to your specific world of commercials? Cause I know that there was a specific attitude in the past, but has that changed now? It really has changed. I would say there have been some kind of, pivotal moments that really changed people's minds. Uh, one particular moment was at the turn of the century, <laughs> the year 2000, uh, Moby released this album, Play. And not too many people knew who Moby was. He was a respected artist, uh, a creative artist, a cool artist. Every single song on that album was licensed to a piece of media. And Moby not only made a great deal of money, but he became an important artist in culture. Um, also Sting, who was having some issues with one of his songs um, on his album, I guess Desert Rose was the name of the song. Uh, he wasn't getting any traction. So he and his manager kind of reached out to Jaguar or Jaguar as they say in Britain. And they said, you can use our song gratis. You don't have to pay a fee for it um, on your Jaguar spot. And Sting will perform in the spot. And obviously uh, you, uh, you don't pay a cent. It's a free, it's a gratis license. and that that's what we'll do that's the deal and it actually really worked for him and the song actually charted so i think people started to pay attention um you know legacy artists like paul mccartney have done a great deal of, of work um as i've talked about before where he's licensed music um his own music to ads uh apple lincoln um and He's associated himself with Starbucks and the Hear Music thing. And then new artists, emerging artists who aren't tainted by kind of the, the concept of selling out. It's not really in their vocabulary. They're young artists who are emerging. They get an offer for a song um, license for 5000 10000 15000 20000 30000 40000 50000 depending on the brand. I mean, what a great way to make money and what a great way to get your music out there. Yeah, I mean, I remember the Apple ads with Feist. Mm. And her manager said that when she did those ads, they elevated her from, I think, like, he, he gave the figures. He said she was making $5,000 a night in performance. She went to ten because mm -hmm. the audience demand to see her. And part of it, too, that, that we're not talking about is the fact that a record company could never and would never put a $40 million campaign behind a song. They just wouldn't do it. And yet Apple did purchase, I think, 46 or $47 million worth of TV time over the five months that that ad ran with that song. So that's something that you simply can't get in traditional marketing. Exactly. It, it's one of the great, great benefits. And it's attached to media. It's attached to an amazing brand. You know, that's like a grand slam if you can get an Apple placement. Uh, Yael Naim had that song, New Soul, and her track became a global hit. Now, what's interesting about the use is it's usually just a 30-second use for an Apple spot. Occasionally a 60-second, but usually a 30-second. So you're hearing the best part of the song, and it's a great way to, to advertise your music as well. In a 30-second segment, heavy rotation, just like it used to be on radio, but with a visual context and a lifestyle brand. Um, Josh, I want to talk to you about two things that I see and get your, your feedback on this in the advertising world. One is, is it my imagination or, 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 or am I just off on this? I see a lot of, I guess, very kind of anthemic and positive songs being used specifically in advertising. Can you talk about like what has spurred that creatively uh, or is that something that you're seeing as well? Well, I've seen it for years. Okay. Um, 
I think there are a bunch of reasons why people use uh, anthemic music. Certainly, I noticed it during the financial crisis that a lot of the advertising was very positive. People obviously were having financial woes and difficulties and didn't have a lot of money to spend. And these brands were trying to create kind of an excitement and a, and a powerful anthemic feeling, an uplifting feeling to their advertising. Now, uplifting anthemic music as it's associated with the brand is obviously a very positive way of going at it. Um, it's, it's rare that you find a juxtaposition of something that's like Scorsese does in his films, where he has a really violent scene with some beautiful music, and it's a very artistic, um, meaningful uh, kind of experience. For advertising, it's usually the brand is a heroic thing. The brand is the hero. Uh, the model of music, there's kind of uh, a paradigm, if you will, where there's generally a build to the music. Um, something, there's an introductory part, maybe there's a problem in the beginning of the commercial introduction, kind of mellow, then it builds up, there's a story, and then there's a payoff. So music that's anthemic generally follows that arc as well. So I think that's another reason. Okay. The, the other thing that I have seen in the last, uh, I guess, maybe 10 years, is prior to that, in the 80s and 90s, music, specifically songs that were used in commercials, were iconic songs like they were ubiquitous. Everybody knew them, like the big Motown hits. Mm -hmm. You and your grandmother knew them. Mm. Today, I see, and, and I put this down to the generational aspect of ad execs who have grown up in this last 20 years. It seems that the advertising business, commercials in general, are open to a wider and more diverse variety of music that's not hits, that's not by big, big, well-known artists. In, but in relation to just being the right vibe and cool thing for their uh, product. Is, is that something you're seeing more of and that you see clients being willing to do more of? Most clients are very willing to do that. They want to be relevant in culture. Um, I remember back years ago when Easy Rider, the film, used music that was popular at the time. Mm -hmm. And it hadn't really been done before. It was mostly scores. And this is kind of the same thing that's happened in advertising, where people kind of tapped into a, an indie approach, a cool approach. You're kind of, your brand is part of this click, this hip click, and it's a lifestyle click. So people are responding to things that are kind of uh, uh, in the underbelly of culture, kind of the underground that are that are fermenting and, and building up. And, and people really want to attach, uh, brand ad executives really want to attach themselves to that kind of aesthetic, if you will. And I think it's an important thing, not for every brand, of course. You know, if, you, if you're talking about pharmaceutical brands or packaged goods, sometimes it's a real stretch when they do things like that. I've seen um, uh, clothing brands use like dubstep, and I'm just like, mm, that's not really working. They're really trying too hard on the music. So it obviously has to resonate with kind of the brand message. But people do want to be cool. And I think a lot of, uh, of the younger people that are kind of ascending in the hierarchy of advertising are really trying to leverage their interests and their taste in the advertising. And music is a very important kind of taste factor and passion point. For that, exactly. The, the other thing I want to ask you that's unique to your world is the amount of approvals mm -hmm. that a piece of music has to go through before becoming the final edit of a commercial. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that process? Yeah, it's, it's a strange process. Sometimes it's really smooth. Sometimes I may have an idea and that idea is kind of positioned and utilized, um, whether it's during the editorial process or in the seed of the concept of the commercial, and it makes its way all the way to the end. That's a rarity. Because there are so many collaborators, because there are so many people um, putting their spice in the soup, if you will, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen, to use another cliche, sometimes these things get whittled down or they get morphed. And it can be problematic at times when there are just too many voices. But what we try to do as music producers and music supervisors is kind of, we know that music is a very subjective, passion point type of thing. We try to create an objectivity or better like an intersubjectivity, if you will try to really figure out what works the best and kind of argue for that and kind of fight for it if it really makes sense. And the process can be exhausting, but when the outcome is great, everyone really appreciates it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with, I guess, your agency, the client, 
the editors, the producers, I guess everybody has input into that whole process as to what is going to be used or not used? Or With music, there are so many players. Okay. Um, certainly in the agency side, there's a the creative team, which is the art director and the copywriter. Mm -hmm. uh, they might have a creative director above them who might have a group creator to group creative director above them and then an executive creative director above them. That's five people. Then you might have the person who's the TV producer at the advertising agency and there's an assistant with them, so that's seven. Then they're the account people. They're, they're the liaisons right. to the clients. And sometimes they really understand the brand and they have something to say. So let's say right now we're at about nine or 10 and then you have the clients. You mentioned the editors. The editors, some of them are super creative and they have amazing input and they can drive things. Many of these editors that work in commercials go on to film and they're really successful and they have a real voice. And then there's the director of the commercial and the production company that's involved. Sometimes the, the directors check out, they direct their commercial and they're on to the next project. Um, but not always. And oftentimes they really have an important say in it and they have people that they want to work with. And it's a lot of kind of infighting, if you will, but it, you have to understand that it is a collaboration. It's never just one visionary. Um, occasionally, the head client has a vision. They dictate to us what they want, and we follow that vision. Right. Um, they're the ones paying the bills. They're the ones whose brand it is. What our role is is to try to come up with something that's taking their vision and either enhancing it or igniting it to a different level. Um, we do have some clients that are totally on point when they, and that their their point of view is, is just exceptional, and you know we, we bow to them, and when we follow their their thing. But some, when it comes to music, it's very difficult to kind of articulate what you want. So the collaboration works really well, and when the collaboration has a meaningful music voice in that collaboration, I think it usually works out for the best. In the last, I guess, maybe 10 years, we've seen an explosion in the proliferation of music, independent music, music libraries, music companies, placement companies. I'm sure you deal and have relationships with many of them. And my question to you is, has the proliferation of all of that music, has it driven the price of what you in the commercial world uh, pay in licensing fees over the last 10 years? Or has it not affected it? I think it has. And I think there are people that for some reason, we're friends with an editor or friends with a director or friends with a creative person at an advertising agency who had a piece of music that they were writing as a favor for them and it got into a, a spot and they didn't get paid a lot of money for it. Um, so imagine that happening at like a hundred different agencies around the country or around the world. So then like this lower price point occurs and then these people they want to get into it more, so they do it again, and then it like doubles. So like all of a sudden, there's there are people that are willing to do things for way below the price point, way, be, way below the market rate that we're accustomed to. Um, and clients are like, oh, well, we only paid you know X for this. Why do we have to pay X times seven or X times 11? Um, let's use that same person or do that. And what I try to say is, yeah, occasionally that thing happens accidentally, but it is a process and you do need craftsmen and craftswomen and artists to do this. Um, sometimes these people that did this one off become like these major players. Right. Um, but yeah, it's because of those types of people um, that have these kind of unique ways in that are offering and willing to do things at a very low price point. Does, does the price point get smushed down and like you said the proliferation there are so many different sources so many people fighting for that thing they're willing to bring the price down um, some libraries you know there's libraries like uh, Extreme Music or APM or Killer Tracks they're all owned by major publishers right I mean they have a pretty high price point and they stick to their price point and then there are like the newbies that are coming in and trying to undercut them and do music that's of uh, the same quality um, at times better at times mm -hmm. worse and they're trying to undercut that, and you always have that in business. Uh, it's becoming more challenging also because um, it's a digital world now, and uh, people are not spending as much money on these massive productions like they used to. When I first started in right. business in the 90s, there, there was a lot more money being spent on music and on the production overall. Now it's cheaper and easier to do it. Man, really great information from Josh.
And what makes this so valuable to you guys is that he is one of the leading experts of music in advertising. So, insiders, question of the day. What did you feel were the most informative aspects of Josh's conversation? Was it the changing attitudes of artists regarding having your music used in commercials? Or was it the incredible benefit and boost to an artist's career that having their music used in an advertisement provided? Or was it the vast number of approvals needed before your music is selected for the final edit? Or maybe it was something else that resonated with you. We'd love to hear from you and connect in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching this video. Make sure to subscribe to Mubu TV for more information on how to educate, empower, and engage your music career. You can also check out a summary of this episode and everything we talked about in the description below as well. And if you enjoyed this video, we'd really love it if you hit the like button and let us know what other kinds of videos and types of content you want to see on our channel. Hit us up in the comments below, and we'll see you in the next video.